let me go back here and grab one of the wing panels for the quarter scale model. Now, you've probably seen videos of this thing flying. If you haven't, go over and look at them. She's, she's pretty to watch. If you see that thing flying and it's got dihedral out here at the tip, well, I changed that. <laughs> I took the dihedral out of the tips. Uh, there was a little bit of Dutch rolling nature to the model, and I took the dihedral out, got rid of the Dutch roll. Uh, that Dutch roll is caused by coupling of the equations of motion of roll and yaw. And by taking the dihedral out, you decouple those equations and the Dutch roll goes away. Uh, the full-size one will still have a little bit of dihedral out here. I, I don't think it'll be as susceptible to the Dutch rolling due to the uh, mass distributions. Uh, the full-size wing, totally different dynamics uh, because of mass distributions and scaling factors. And I think I can still have the dihedral in there that'll make it handle and fly a little bit nicer and not encounter the Dutch roll problem, but uh, time will tell. So here you you can now see in this configuration, You uh, here I still have the winglet. The winglet's on here. You can see how that's acting as a fence for the spanwise flow. I have it positioned uh, fairly far aft. Uh, you know that these are uh, f freely pivoted, and that's part of the auto yaw control solution. You can go watch the auto yaw video, find out how that works. And uh, they're positioned both inboard and aft uh, so that they have the same uh, stability effectiveness uh, as if they were out at the tip here. And you'll notice that there are no control surfaces out at the wing tip. That design factor has been uh, locked in and the control surface is inboard. And I've actually extended the Elevon much further inboard uh, to get more control effectiveness. And I've left this gap here Actually, at one point, I had the Elevon running all the way out here to the winglet, and uh, I decided to go back to having this open space here uh, to keep the flow going straight here and put the Elevon a little bit inboard on that. Now, this Elevon turned out to be not quite effective enough, and I think I would go back and I would just cut this space in half. You really don't need much space here uh, to keep that flow going straight. You'll note that the fence here has a 90 degree intersection with the wing. And that's done on purpose uh, for a reason. Now I'll get to that in just a second. And it's positioned aft to get more control effectiveness. And you might be asking, how does it actually work as a fence then? Uh, once you just get a bunch of spanwise flow up here and you told me that the short fence uh, doesn't do its job, uh, that it needs to be really tall, like up in here. And I'll say, well, you're, that, that's partially true, but, you have to stop and think, we're flying in an incompressible flow uh, manner or regime. Uh, we're flying very slow. The flow is incompressible. Flow doesn't become compressible until you get very close to supersonic speeds. And when you have incompressible flow, this flow field that's up here before the winglet is actually influenced by the winglet itself. you got to imagine that. The flow that's in front of the wing any flow that's in front of the wing is actually being affected by the wing before it gets to the wing. Uh, you'll see that when wings are an angle of attack and somebody draws the streamlines, uh, the streamlines are actually angling up slightly before they get to the wing. Uh, and that's just the nature of incompressible flow. So I can position this winglet aft and still straighten out the flow in front of the winglet ever so slightly. So aerodynamically, this winglet actually is a little further forward than what it appears to be physically, uh, and uh, just taking advantage of the uh, nature of incompressible flow that way. So I can push it quite a ways further aft, and still I'm creating a fence effect here by forcing the flow to go straight. This flow's running straight because it knows the winglet's coming, and it's got to be lined up with the winglet. This flow's not going to be going off this way because the air molecules that are back here are going to be dragging their buddies along with them, and everything's getting lined up and going straight. So still very effective as a fence, even though it's further aft. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, this fence here, and I'm going to get my buddy the boundary layer piece here. Uh, I got two of them here. The reason you want a 90-degree intersection here is so that you get a little bit of... Um, turbulence generated by flow interference. And what's happening, uh, if you imagine that this is the actual fence, and I got flow going on this surface, and I got flow going on this surface, and that's what we have here except on a miniature scale. We got flow going along this surface, flow along here, and flow along here. So there are two boundary layers. There's this boundary layer, turn the wing this way, 
we have a boundary layer on the wing like this, and it's everywhere around here. And these are going aft, going aft, going aft, going aft. Well, we also have a boundary layer on these vertical surfaces. And that boundary layer looks like this. Okay, it's on the side here. So, and of course, you've got to remember, these boundary layers are tiny. In fact, if you look at the tufts on this wing, these tufts are about, the diameter of this thread is about one-third the thickness of the boundary layer. So for, on these models, the boundary layer is just thousandths of an inch thick um, before you're up to the free stream velocity. However, in the corner here, so you got these boundary layers that are coming in like this. If I can turn it this way, you got boundary layer, boundary layer, boundary layer, all the way up to here. Oh, and I got boundary layer here too, going back this way. Oh, golly, I got them here and here and here. Interference. This is flow interference between a horizontal and a vertical service. And uh, you've, talked, you've heard of interference drag. That's where that comes from. Uh, the interference drag is a mixing of the boundary layers uh, between uh, surfaces that are angled relative to each other. Usually it's a 90 degree uh, interface like this. So when you have that flow interference, it sets up turbulence in the corner here where they meet. And you get a little, little tiny vortex in there. So you get a little bit of turbulence on each side. Well, that little vortex that's going aft along this fence, that's what keeps the flow aligned. Remember, I talked about the Vorolons generating a large vortex on the top of the wing. Well, by leaving a 90-degree corner here between the fence and the wing, we're paying a little penalty in drag, but we're, we're laying down a vortex in here, some turbulent flow that helps keep the flow on this portion of the wing going straight back. That's why fences that have fillets on them don't work. Because when you have a fillet, you gotta, I'm going to ask you to imagine this. So I got a fence here, and rather than being 90 degrees, it's got this nice curve to it because I want to get rid of the interference drag. And that's a mistake. You don't want to get rid of that interference drag. You want it so that you keep the flow going straight. And what happens is, is with a fillet, I got boundary layer, boundary layer, boundary layer, boundary layer, boundary layer, boundary layer, and it just goes up around the curve like this. And by the time you get up to the top, if the fillet's the right size, if it's made large enough, by the time you get up to the top of the fillet, this boundary layer is now out of interference with that boundary layer. In this greatly exaggerated example, the fillet would have to be about this large. It would have to go from here and curve up. But this boundary layer can be on that fillet all the way around, and you don't have any interference drag. That's why fillets work. That's why we fill it in aerodynamic surfaces, and you got that nice, smooth shape, and it looks nice to everybody. Well, it looks nice because you're preventing that interference drag. But if you have a fence on a wing and you want to stop spanwise flow, that fillet's the last thing you want. You want to have that interference drag. So if you go look at that Horton-esque thing and you see the uh, fence that they have on the wing, they've got a little bit of fillet in there, and that's probably aggravating their situation. They're not, that fence is not as effective as they think it is by looking at it. Now, uh, you might say, gee, Raul, generating drag just to keep the flow straight, I thought we wanted to get the drag knocked down. Well, on the full-size one, I will. The 90-degree um, intersection with the wing is only for this portion of the fence until we get to the winglet here that's doing its big job of straightening the flow. And back here, the full-size one will actually have a fillet. There's a fillet that runs between the winglet mount and the wing on both sides. And that fillet, interestingly enough, as a little aside, is actually the alignment mechanism for when the wing panels are assembled. So when this winglet mount gets assembled here, that fillet, the wing actually slips inside of it and prevents the wing from rotating, uh, prevents the mount from rotating. And likewise, on the outer panel, when this panel comes in, the aft portion slips inside those fillets that are top and bottom, and they provide uh, a structural stop and, and keep this uh, wing panel locked in place and helps transfer the torsional loads from out here into here. So uh, fill it in there both to uh, address the aerodynamic issue of the interference drag and to provide a, a mechanical system for locking the wing panels in place. So a uh, double whammy, a win-win. So there's a little bit of discussion about uh, uh, this arrangement, why it's done this way, and uh, the advantages of it. Now, as a little aside, uh, just to be uh, fully transparent and tell you how engineering really works, it's like, 
man, you must be the biggest genius on the planet to all of a sudden understand winglets out at the tip are wrong. You've got to put them inboard to be really effective. And, and to tell you the truth, no, I hadn't actually thought it up that way. Uh, this was by happenstance. Uh, and that often happens in engineering, especially when you're doing cut and try engineering. An early, early concept, the first version of this, which was about three versions before these models, I was planning on using this entire outer panel as the elevant. And the whole panel was going to rotate like this uh, to be the elevant. And the concept was, I got my two wing panels, and I'm going to rotate my Elevon panel up like this, it goes to uh, want to rotate like this in it because it's a swept wing, it tilts the whole wing up like this, and to get a higher angle of attack, I go more, 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 more. So the geometry of it is such that the more I deflect the Elevon surface, the higher the angle of attack on the inboard portion of the wing, but surprisingly enough, the angle of attack of this Elevon panel out here doesn't increase that rapidly. The angle of attack of the inboard portion of the wing uh, increases much faster than the Elevon, and the Elevon stays flying all the time. The Elevon never approaches a stall angle of attack. And I thought, that's one that I had thought up ahead of time. Thought it was a brilliant solution. We're like, wow, what a great idea. And later discovered I wasn't the first one to have it. It's been tried on other configurations. And as I went out and tested the model, I got a whole panel out here. It's got a pivot tube on here, and I can make this whole panel go up and down. Hadn't quite figured out how I'm going to carry all the loads on the full-size one, but I left that for later. I figure, figure that out later. And I chuck it into the sky and discover I have almost no roll control. Uh, <laughs> the amount of panel that you need to make that whole concept effective is a third or half of the semi-span. It's huge. Uh, and to have that whole panel out here going up and down on some type of gigantic bearing pivot arrangement that has to carry all the bending loads yet still pivot freely was, but it would take those loads or I designed something, it's really heavy. Uh, you got to transfer tremendous bending loads uh, inboard through a bearing for a surface that's pivoting up and down all the time. Uh, so that pretty much killed it right there. So lack of control effectiveness, for a small enough panel where the loads aren't too bad, and then it would have had to been really huge. And in the process of doing all of that, I need the winglets. And I just couldn't imagine putting a winglet out here and having this winglet doing this all the time. Every time this tip would deflect, oh, the winglet's like this, and then the winglet's down here and up here. And I thought, well, that's just dumb. Uh, that's just going to look stupid. And I'm going to have all types of uh, uh, moment of inertia problems. If I got the mass of the winglet out here, and this thing's moving up and down, it's like, well, that's going to cause all kinds of problems. Well, I'll solve my problem. I just won't put the winglets out at the tip. I'll move them in here, and I'll just make them bigger. So <laughs> the winglets being inboard are a result of experimenting with this other control system, which I'm no longer using, and it got eliminated because it's not effective. But in the process, I discovered the power of placing the winglets inboard and how they can act as a tremendous fence and stop that spanwise flow. And there they stayed. So, serendipity. Uh, wish I would have been smart enough to think this up ahead of time, but at least I was bright enough to realize uh, something good when I tripped over it and, and held on to that. So, winglets inboard works out much better. Oh, you might be wondering, hey, Raul, winglets out at the wingtip. I heard that they stop the vortex that's out here, or they help damp out that vortex, or they pull some energy out of the vortex and actually increase the efficiency of the wing. Um, and uh, that's true on regular wings, uh, but not on flying wings, uh, most flying wings anyway. Let me get uh, the uh, uh, marker board, and I'll draw it for you, and, and you'll see why that is a false assumption. get this guy back up here. I hope we don't have too much reflection here. And bear with me while I use my hand to wipe this off. Okay. I'm going to draw one line here, and that's our wing. This is the root of our wing. This is the tip, right? And you're saying, hey, you put a winglet out here, and you stop that vortex from rolling up like this. And that increases the efficiency of the wing. So when you moved your winglet inboard, you, you lost that efficiency gain. 
And on a regular wing, that would probably be somewhat true. But on a flying wing, we normally have distribute. Uh, your normal aircraft wing will have a, a, a close to elliptical lift distribution. It goes out like this, and comes down like this. And I don't draw elliptical very well, but there you go. It's something like that. Flying wings are not like that. In order to get our stability, we quite often get close to the bell-shaped lift distribution, which goes like this. Okay? The lift out here at the tip, in many cases, is zero, sometimes even negative. Sometimes the tip is downloaded in certain flight configurations. Sometimes it has a small upload on it. But mostly, the wing tip is doing nothing but providing pitch stability. It's not actually providing a lot of lift. This bell-shaped lift distribution is what gives us tremendous yaw stability on flying wings. And this lift distribution is created by the washout pattern that's in the wing. Well, gosh, if the wing's not lifting out here, if you just stop and think about it for a second, if there's no lift out at the wingtip, there's no vortex rolling up out here. There's no vortex to stop. There's no vortex to pull any energy out of. It just doesn't exist. In fact, I'll put a picture up here if I can find it. Uh, I'll try to find the picture, put it up. Al Bowers at NASA has actually shown with trailing edge uh, telltales that uh, with the bell-shaped lift distribution or parental lift, lift distribution, there's no vortex out here. The first, first vortex is inboard. It's here. So you're, And remember, the wing has trailing edge vortices all the way along it until it stops generating lift. So having a flying wing with winglets is actually, uh, you'll have to bear with me on the word, stupid. Uh, because people haven't stopped to think, there's no vortex out there. You put the winglet out there to gain efficiency to stop this vortex, none of that's happening. It's just simply you don't understand the flow conditions out at the wingtip. There's no vortex there. You might want to put the winglet out there for control effectiveness, moment arm, yeah, I understand that. But if you're putting a winglet out there to stop the vortex, eh, well, you're confused over what's actually happening. And that's a stupid place to put it. Now, because there are trailing edge vortices along any wing until you stop generating lift, I can put a winglet here, and I can set it aft. And when I set that winglet aft, I'm placing it in the trailing edge vortex, and I'm stopping the vortex there, pulling energy out of it, and it actually increases the performance of the wing. So you can place a winglet inboard and gain the true effectiveness of that winglet as both a fence and as some energy recovery out of the trailing edge vortices and stopping the vortices in this general region here. There's no vortices out here. This is a non-lifting surface out at the tip. So uh, a little side lesson there before we get back to our stall spin problem. So uh, I think we've gone uh, far enough there, and I'm going to come back with a segment later, and we're going to dive in a little bit more uh, about the Elevon configuration and uh, how this is designed and got set up this way. And we're going to get very, very close to that uh, final aha moment about designing elephants to prevent stall spin. So come on back and watch some more later.